All right, well, good morning, everyone. We're going to get fired up here. Uh, before we get kind of like all officially started, a couple of things. Um, one of our back row people is going to be leaving us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very quickly, tell them where, where you're going and what you're going to be doing. Yeah, she wasn't sent, she wasn't sentenced there. She's going there on purpose. <laughs> and what are you going to be studying? So there's something for your prayer sheets. As she's going to be going to the Greek frozen tundra of Minot, North Dakota. Uh, I, I've been to North Dakota. My Whitney, several of you follow Whitney because of her unbelievable post on Facebook. Uh, lived in North Dakota for a while, north of Minot, um, and so yeah, it's um, they have two seasons, much like Arizona does, where we have summer and not summer. They also have two seasons. They have winter and not winter. They have winter and mosquito season. <laughs> so she's going to be going in for a, a radical change. Uh, the other thing, kind of by way of announcement, is this Saturday is the first potluck dinner, or bridge potluck dinner. We suspended that a couple years ago due to COVID and all that stuff. For those of you that haven't been to one, this is a way for people that are not teenagers to meet the teenagers of the church. Um, so it starts at 5 o'clock, and I asked JT, what should they bring? And he said, Whatever you want. You want to bring a main dish, you want to bring a side dish, you want to bring a dessert. He said he eats it all, so. <laughs> um, I, I've gone to a number of these things before they got suspended due to, due to the COVID stuff, and it's a great way to meet the teenagers that you see bopping around here that if you don't happen to know their parents and the kids directly, and you just recognize the face. Um, and it's a great way to then kind of bridge that's the name of the bridge potluck, like that gap between the younger generation and those of us who are supposed to be mentoring and praying for that younger generation. It's a little difficult to pray for them if you don't know them besides, you know, yeah, it's just that, that kid. Um, so that's coming up. Um, I want to say thank you to Scott for covering for me last week. Um, I, I read over his notes. It looked pretty fantastic. I, I, I felt bad for him because of, of the entire series, this was probably one of the tougher ones. It just, that was the luck of the draw. Um, but I, I think he did an excellent, excellent job with it um, when I looked over, over his notes and, and, and his PowerPoint and whatnot. So again, thank you for that, Scott. It's great as a teacher to have people that you can rely on. Because I was over at our, we go to a thing called Pageant of the Masters which has been going since the 30s over in uh, Laguna Beach where they reproduce art but use live people. And that doesn't even begin to describe it. That's kind of the thumbnail sketch. It's, it's incredible. Uh, and so I, we were getting back from that. So that's where I was last weekend. So with that, I don't, can't think of any other big announcements or anything. Um, before everybody sits down, Everybody should have a copy of Psalm 91. Does anybody not have a copy of this? This is a little new and different. Because I'm going to do something a little new and different today. I try to keep things shaken up and do things slightly different on a regular basis. Good news was Pastor Jerry, he was walking around the office all week without his, 
is a little walker thing. So yeah, things are. He kind of attributes to stepping off a curb last week, and I, <laughs> you know, whatever works. Elbow all messed up. Yeah, well, yeah, no. <laughs> traded one pain for another, but. All right, as you can see, we're going into Psalm 91, and again, just kind of remind you, we're progressing through the Psalms, not through Jesus' life chronologically. We're numerically going through the Psalms as they, so that's why we keep jumping, you know, four, five, ten Psalms at a time, because this is the next one where Jesus' life has an interaction with it. Um, but let's kind of review what, what you got last week real quick. Oh, I didn't put that in there. <laughs> I put it in my notes, but didn't put it in my PowerPoint. That's why I get for going to uh, Flagstaff to hang out with my grandkids. <laughs> um, right in the beginning of Psalm 82 that you guys covered last week, what is God doing in the great assembly? Presides. He's presiding. He's in charge. And Psalm 82 starts right off by pointing out, hey, I'm in charge of this. There isn't anybody else, I'm, I'm, I'm the boss. Also in Psalm 82, God pronounces a what by calling out, I forgot, I'm not clicking through things that aren't on the board. He pronounces a what by calling out oppressors and their so-called gods. What does he pronounce? What's that? Kind of, look, judgment comes after this, it's still in that legal setting. Before you get judged, you have to be indicted. And he pronounces an indictment. He says, here's the charge against it. The comparison or the interaction with Jesus' life was came out of the book of John. And in, in that area, in John chapter 10, verses 24 to 30, believers are equated with sheep. And they're asked to do two things. What are those two things that any good a shepherd would say his sheep are supposed to do, but this pronounces to Jesus and his people, what are the two things that the sheep are supposed to do? Listen and follow. Yeah, listen and then follow. Yeah, because you have to you have to listen first. You gotta know, okay, which way are we going? <laughs> and then follow or, or obey. Absolutely. And that goes back then with Psalm 82. Again, who's in charge? Who is that shepherd? Who's making the who's indicting those false gods and who's actually in charge? You also saw last week that the people were going to stone Jesus. Why? Being, saying he's the son, or being, saying he's God. Yeah, or saying, I am, I am that guy from Psalm 82. And they kind of lost, lost their mind. Hmm. So, again, that's kind of review, see where we were last week. I want to introduce you to uh, William McDonald, uh, a very well-known Bible scholar, wrote a... Uh, a very interesting um, commentary on, on the entire Bible, um, of which I have a copy of that, too. Uh, in 1922, he writes this about his life story. In 1922, in the Western Hebrides, anybody know where the Western Hebrides are? It's a group of islands off of Scotland. So now, ooh, hey, we're having a, a geological lesson in the middle of the Sunday school there. So now the next time you're on a game show and you get that question, you win money, remember that you know I get a cut there because you now know where the Western Hebrides is. A five-year-old boy was dying of diphtheria. A mucous membrane was forming across his throat and breathing was becoming increasingly difficult. His Christian mother turned her back so she wouldn't see him die. And at that very moment, there was a knock at the door it was her brother-in-law from a nearby village. He said, I've just come to tell you that you don't have to worry about the child. He's going to recover, and one day, God is going to save his soul. Now, she was a little distracted and incredulous. She's watching her five-year-old son die in front of her eyes. 
Whatever makes you say that? And her brother-in-law explained that he'd been sitting in his home in front of his fire reading Psalm 91 when God distinctly pointed out the last three verses, uh, which you're going to hear in a minute, plus you have them in front of you. That boy survived and 13 years later gave his life to Jesus. Well, of course, that story is the story of William MacDonald. Now, MacDonald, when you read his stuff, he readily agrees that Psalm 91 is a messianic psalm. This is talking about the Messiah. But, that being said, that's its primary interpretation. He found that in some way, it still applies to his followers as well. And it would have to. Anything that applies to the Messiah applies to his people who are in the Messiah. And so that, that became, to, uh, to William MacDonald, he said that Psalm 91 was his psalm because of the way that it had impacted his life, had impacted his uncle's life, who had brought assurance to his mother, and sure enough, exactly as his brother-in-law had predicted, he would later become a Christian, become a well-known theologian, and like I said, you can pick up his, his commentary today on in Christian bookshelves. Well, welcome back, Texas Travelers. It's good to see you. We've kept those seats open all summer, so. You mean nobody wants to sit in the front row? <laughs> So with that, let's get into Psalm 91. Everybody should have a copy. I printed out a copy so that we were all on the same version for chuckles and grins. Um, in my study, I found that this psalm was often read in a response, a call and response method. Um, some. A priest or one of the leaders in the in the in the congregation at the uh, at the synagogue would read verses one and two. The people would read verses three through thirteen together, and then a single reader uh, speaking for God would read verses fourteen to sixteen. So that's what we're going to do. I have somebody to read verses fourteen to sixteen. I'm going to read verse one and two, and then we are going to read out loud together, slowly. <laughs> Verses 3 through 13, and then Mark is going to pick up and read those last three verses. So let's read Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the power and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that starts in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will look only with your eyes. You will see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer. Psalm 91, 
16 quick verses, but let's, let's unpack this a little bit. So the psalm describes God's ongoing sovereign protection of his people and the everlasting or ever-present dangers and terrors which are all around. Of course, this is a messianic psalm, so this is also speaking of how God is going to deal with Jesus when he is here. And we're going to see that play out. You probably, as we're reading that, you probably recognize some verses in there that you think, oh, I know where that, that comes from, but don't, don't jump too far ahead of me yet. When even a casual reader learns that nothing can harm a child of God unless the Lord permits it. As you read through Psalm 91, what do you see in there that can harm somebody that God has? Unless he permits it. Nothing. He goes to that entire list. Not pestilence, not terrors by night, not lying, all of this stuff. Now, all of those promises will be completed in the Messianic Kingdom. But it even applies to believers now. If we have something, and I'm going to put this in air quotes, bad happen to us, what is it for? Our good. It's for our good. There's something in it for us or for others. Now, the psalm breaks down kind of like this. Verses 1 and 2, we have confidence expressed. The writer is expressing his confidence. This is what God is going to do. This is who he is. Then verses 3, 3 through 13, we see nine different areas or types of protection, pretty much covering anything you can imagine in, in general groupings. And then the last three verses is the Lord's pledge, what the Lord says he's going to do. So let's kind of look at that in, in, those, in that order then. The confidence expressed. Believers live under the protection of the Most High God. That's where you live. Every day that you go out in your life, you are living under the protection of the God who spoke everything into existence. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you live like you believe that? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> some days yes some days not so much if you're like me the, the writer here calls him most high and that emphasizes that no threat that we face can ever, ever overpower him God is on high again this is kind of a military look and anybody that's ever served in the military will tell you that the place you want to be is on the high ground. You want your enemy coming up to you because that's a lot of work on there. It's much more defensible. That's why everybody's always trying to take a mountain peak. That's why air power is so important because that's the ultimate high ground. You want your enemy to come up at you. He is the most high. Nothing can get to you outside of what he's done. Then he's called the shadow of the Almighty. In a place where the sun, now think about, in Arizona, we can really relate to the Middle East in this, in that the sun is an ever-present thing with us and can be dangerous, can it not? No. Heat stroke, sun stroke, dehydration, all that stuff. So. Under a shadow is a place where the, you know, in a place where a sun can be dangerous and oppressive, a shadow is always a very good thing. I'll tell you what, when I was working off duty as a police officer early in my career, which meant traffic jobs, which meant standing around for hours while guys dug holes in the intersection that messed you all up while you were driving. And I would spend all day out there. A lot of times, sometimes the, the, the guys working the cable or the phone lines, they'd go down one of those manholes. They'd have a little tent set up over that and an airflow going down. And they're down in the hole. So there wasn't even anybody for me to talk to. I'm just standing out there all day, hoping that nobody has an accident while this is going on. Well, for a few months of the year, that's not bad. 
For a number of months of the year, that can be in, in a dark blue suit that's not cotton. <laughs> that could be, so I would find a light pole. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know every, every five minutes is the sun would move <laughs> and if I got real lucky a bird would land on top of the light pole and I'd get a little extra so this whole under, under the shadow thing particularly for Arizonans Phoenicians we can understand what that is that's living under the shadow is a good thing it's a protection and because of that, the writer uses the descriptors, because you're living under that shadow, under that protection, he uses the descriptors there in verses 1 and 2 of refuge, fortress, and the God in whom he trusts. I gave you a handout today so you can write all over Psalm 91, because some of you don't aren't Bible writers like me. So now you have a copy of Psalm 91 that you can start circling and underlining things to your little heart's content. If you're not a Bible writer. So that sets up um, all that expression of confidence and living under the shadow and what, what he describes God as. Now, picking up in verse 3 then, um, we're going to look at nine types of protection. And I'm going to kind of run through these relatively quickly. In verse 3, protection from hidden dangers. It's written as the snare of the fowler. Fowlers would go out and trap birds, some to be sold at the temple for sacrifices, some to be sold as food. Well, birds are, and no pun intended, flighty creatures. <laughs> Ever tried to sneak up on a bird? Pretty difficult. So they would set up a trap. So the first area of protection is protection from hidden dangers, dangers that you don't even know are there until you step in. I, I like that that's the first one he lists because a lot of the others are somewhat visible or manipulable to some degree. But it's that hidden thing, that thing you never, anybody ever done that? Stepped into the middle of something and found yourself going, oh man, and you didn't see it coming at all. Yeah, pretty much everybody can probably nod your head. Because that's very common. And God says, I have you protected from the hidden dangers. Because they're all around you. Also in verse 3, it's immunity from fatal disease. It says plagues or ep epidemics. Does this mean that a believer never dies of a disease? No. Are there all kinds of fatal diseases out there? Yes. Absolutely. And God says, I've got you protected on that front too. That little teeny virus thing that you can't see outside of an electron microscope. I've got you on that one. While you are doing what I have for you to do, while you are being obedient to my will and doing what I have set out for you to do, because I have your days numbered to the exact second, that fatal disease is not going to touch you. Again, I want you, I'm not going to ask it for a show of hands, do we live like that? He calls himself shelter and refuge, or the, that's what it is, with the term under his wings, or under his feathers. What does shelter and refuge mean? Protection. From? The element. Yeah. You have a place to be, you have a place to stay, that you have... A block from the sun, you have a block from the rain, you have a block from the wind, you have some place that you can heat up and hold on to heat. A basic survival need. Food yes. Food. Yeah, on the, on the greater Maslow hierarchy of needs, this is right at the base level stuff. Also in 
verse 4, he, there's protection in the faithfulness of God. He will cover you with his feathers under his wings. You will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. So we have protection in his faithfulness. That's why all the rest of them work. Because God is faithful. He's always a protection. Not sometimes. I saw on Facebook uh, yesterday some lady asking for a roofer that could come help because of, she said it looks like she has some bad leaks to the point where she says she sees her her inner roof sagging. Okay, well that's a bad leak. <laughs> that means now that that part's all destroyed if it's sagging and whatnot. But God is faithful. He doesn't have to go back and, and rechange the roof. <laughs> he is the roof. He is that shelter that we saw there in that verse as well. In verses 5 and 6, we have protection from fear. And in, in my little book on fear, some of you that, that haven't and have read it, you'll see some reference here out of Psalm into this particular this area. Um, you will not fear the terror of the night. That's fear, you know, again, fear. Nor the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. At night, hidden attacks. That you're going to be attacked, but of course, if you want to attack somebody, when's a great time to do it? At night, because they can't see. It's hard to defend. I told Cindy last night, we were driving back from Flagstaff, and we were much later than I anticipated. And I said, well, we got home, and I said, well, I'm officially old. She said, <coughs> Well, I know, but why? <laughs> I said, I don't like driving at night anymore. And I don't mean at night going downtown, coming to the church. I meant on the highway, and particularly coming down the mountain from, from Flagstaff. I said, I can't see. And so I'm much tenser because I, and I can't put on my high beams because there's just enough traffic that I can't screw with everybody else's vision, and I can't see. So he says, protection at night, that hidden attack. Then protection by day, the arrows by day. That's a distance attack. Arrow is not an upfront, close and personal attack. It's not a knife attack. A knife attack, where do you have to be? You know, arm's reach. Or as we trained in the, fit, the police department, within 15 feet. And, and we've shown that to numerous people all the time that we're very anti-gun, and we show them that a guy with a knife out can get to you and cut you if he's within 15 feet before you can unholster and get off a shot. 15 feet. That's me to Paul. And it's been, and even the, the guys that are really good, if that guy's out with a knife, he's got you. But an arrow, that's much more long distance. How far can you effectively shoot an arrow, Cindy? That's a lot farther than 15 feet. Yeah. And, but this is a daytime. You also don't shoot arrows at night, do you? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because you just can't see, you can't judge the distance. So we have a nighttime fear, we have daytime fear. Plague in the darkness. Both literal, the physical illness thrives. When does physical illness tend to thrive? When do people tend to be the most sick? At night. At night. You notice that? You can feel a little better today, and you can almost time it. As the sun goes down, how do you begin to feel? You feel worse. The current pandemic, which still never ceases to amaze me, of watching people walk down the street by themselves in the daylight with a mask on. Because the first thing they told us early on, and this is settled in science, is that UV rays kill that virus just about that quick. So if you're out in the sunlight, you are golden. And we've got plenty of that here. So again, we have the literal, the physical illness that thrives at night, because that's when illness can thrive. It doesn't have the sun killing it. And more figurative is because moral evil breeds best in the dark. And when I was doing home and group talks about how to harden your homes for safety, 
I used to quote the Bible verse that men love darkness rather than light for their deeds are evil. Because one of the things I would teach homeowners is put light around your house at night. If you ever come to my house, you're going to see it lit up. I've got a front porch light. I've got three lights over the driveway. And in my backyard, I've got a light there too. Now, does that physically stop anybody? No. no. But if I've got this well-lit house and two houses down is dark as midnight, which one do you think the bad guys are going to go to? So we have both a kind of a literal and a figurative here because moral evil breeds best in the darkness. And God says, I'm going to take care of that fear as well. And then we have destruction at noon. And I found that one very interesting. Because it's daylight, you can see. It's high noon. Everything is at its apex. What does that mean? When do you feel safest? Daytime. When, and in all the westerns, when did they have the shootout? High noon. Why was that? No shadow. Nobody getting the sun in their eyes. So the sun's straight overhead, no shadow. I don't have the advantage of the sun setting. I'm looking at the sun. You've got, you know, you're looking away from the sun. It was always at high noon. You felt the safest at high noon. God describes that as well. I've got you at daytime. I've got you at nighttime. I've got you long distance. I've got you up close and personal. I've got you when you think you are the safest at high noon. I've got you. You don't have to be afraid. The next one, number six of these nine types of protection is in verses seven and eight, safety in the middle of a massacre. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right side, but it will not come near you. You will look only with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. So does that mean the massacre isn't gonna happen? No. What does it say? You're going to be a spectator. Wow. Look at all them. Wow. Look at all them. Huh. Wow. I was involved in a fatal police shooting 11 months after I got out of the police academy at a distance of about 18 inches. Defense people will tell you that's way too close. Again, a guy with a knife. But he was so busy going to, trying to stab my partner that he went right past me. I shot him once. My partner who he was trying to shoot, who he was trying to stab with a butcher knife, shot him two more times. He was 270 pounds and not an athlete. <laughs> and we were very disappointed because we'd all been raised in TV and the movies. When you shoot somebody, what happens to them? None of they fall, they get blown back about three feet and generally through a plate glass window. <laughs> he kept coming. In fact, as he stepped between us, and we were on a, up, a second story landing of a, an apartment complex. So a very short distance between the front door and the rail. And, and he stepped between us. I shot him, he kept moving. Now he's between me and my partner. He fires two rounds. Of course, where am I? I <laughs> I'm downrange. Right. A third officer came running up, had, was already responding, saw what was going on, un, unholstered, and fired six more rounds. Where was I? I was downrange. <laughs> I became one with a piece of one by one. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally, and I. I it's no story. It was winter, so I had my, my winter coat on. And after we got, after it was done, and then he finally went, he finally, his body said, okay, I'm done. And he was done. I took my coat and went like this because I was looking for holes because I knew I was down range with multiple nine millimeter rounds going off. I was in the middle of something. And not a thing touched me. Nothing. Harry, would yes. that apply to everyone though? Like, I mean, 
If, what this says is, I'm, remember, this is all about fear. I don't have to be afraid if I'm in the middle of a massacre. God has me. Now, if it's God, if it's my time to go home, yeah, I'm, I'm God, but I was going to go home that day anyway. <laughs> but I don't have to stand there and be afraid. This is all having to do with fear, all of these. There, it's nine types of protection. I don't have to be afraid of this stuff. I think, like, in a lot of cases, I think other people probably think this way, too. This is how I, I'm not too scared of dying. I'm, I'm more scared of, of the pain. <laughs> yes, exactly. So <laughs> the with the process. Yeah, I told several people, I, death has no fear for me. The process, <laughs> eh, not really interested in. Quick, you know. Yeah. I, I want to, you know, I want to be like my, my wife's grandmother. One day I'm here and one day I'm bent over in front of the, in, in the bathroom and bent over on the ground and that was it. But yeah, that, that process, I, I agree. I'm not really interested in, in that. Um, but I don't have to be afraid. God's got me protected. Even in the, and you talk to missionary stories, missionary after missionary story of God protecting them in the middle of all kinds of crazy stuff. Verses 9 and 10, we have insurance against calamity. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall, no, again, okay, you've got, you've got some, if you're not a Bible writer, circle the word no on Psalm 91, uh, verse 10. No evil, or underline it, however you want to catch your attention. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. When God says no evil, how much evil is going to be allowed to come to you? No. How much plague is going to be allowed to come near you? No. Do we live like this list? No. <laughs> Yes. Um, the word prudent. I know I got messed around a lot. But it, it, to me, I can't see that I have the freedom to walk into a windmill. We should use, to what extent do you use caution? Right, and we're going to actually see some of that next week when, or actually this week as well, when. Jesus says, don't test the Lord your God. Thank you. So, yeah, you're there. You're just, you're a, you're a step ahead of me. But we have this list, but none of this list says, okay, now I'm going to just say, all right, God, uh, I've got three different ways I should go. I'm going to take the really crazy, stupid, dangerous route just so that you can live up to this. But if I find myself in the middle of this, I don't have to go, but God never says, go find this stuff and step into it just so you can show how powerful I am. We had the blessing of a chicken coming over to our house and deciding to have a brood. And it was fascinating to see, and I really relate with the spreading of feathers. Anytime, I mean, they would be scattered 10 foot apart. Nine of them. Nine of them. And if anything, a shadow or anything, they would gather under her wings, and she would have fought to the death. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You know, and I don't have to worry about God dying, so I'm a little safer than the chicks were. <laughs> yeah. But there was always one stupid one who had to come out first to see, did he go away yet? Yeah. Is it, is it okay? Yeah. That was probably the middle child. <laughs> if one of you are middle child, sorry. That's, I'm always banging on my my number two brother for that, because he was always the first one to poke his nose out. Um, where was he? Okay, insurance against calamity. Now, verse 11 and 12, and this is where we're really going to key in, and some of you, as we were reading this, probably you already made the connection. Guardian angels. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone.
Guardian angels are a real thing. Yes. They're not the bumper sticker stupid stuff. Never fly fat, you know, never drive faster than your guardian angel can fly. Oh, please. But God has given angel in charge of you. Have you read what angels do when God gives them a task in the Bible? Did you, have you seen what a single angel did to an entire army? One. Not his legion of angels. One. Yes. You know, because you think about them fighting Satan and, you know, meeting this and it, Because there's a spiritual, spiritual battle going on for you. Yes. Satan and his forces are on a spiritual attack, and you've got somebody with that kind of power under God's authority that's protecting you. Now, there's some physical aspects to it sure, as well. Sure, you know, they'd rather do damage to you spiritually and, mm -hmm. and make you not, you know, make you fearful and not thinking about these things. They know if you die, you're going to go to heaven. They better keep you alive here messing up. <laughs> yeah, the best way to get in, to defeat an enemy is not to kill them. That's messy and takes time and expense. The best way is to get your enemy not to fight. Right. We're seeing that in a geopolitical thing right now. China is trying to get the world to just back off without them ever firing literally a shot. Same thing goes spiritually. If I can get a Christian to back off and not live for Christ and not live in the fearlessness, then I haven't had to fire a shot and I've, all I had to do is use a little fear and they quit fighting. <clears throat> then finally, number nine, protection against natural attacks, the lion and the cobra. Verse 13, you will tread on the lion and some of your Bibles will say cobra or the adder, we're talking poisonous snake. Again, Arizonans, we can relate. We have poisonous snakes here. Uh, the only difference is here, our snakes warn you. Over there, when I was in Africa, they have poisonous snakes that don't tell you that they're there until they bite you. I like rattlesnakes <laughs> because they tell me um, you get a black mamba over there and it hits you and if you don't have that stuff right there, you're dead. So it says you will tread on these. Now I find something interesting, what, one of the Bible scholars I was looking at, oh, i got to pick up the pace here. Um, how is Satan portrayed as a serpent and as a roaring lion out to devour those whom he can. Now, I had never made that connection before, but here the psalmist, and one of those verses hadn't even been written yet because it's New Testament. <laughs> of course, he's a serpent in the, in the Old Testament, and again, then Revelation we saw. But then he's described as that roaring lion seeing whom he can devour. And God says, you will step on. But in a regular, just a direct translation, what does that mean? That's going to be natural, natural things, natural attacks. Stuff that's just out there in nature. The lion and the poisonous snake. So nine areas of protection. Now, of these nine, and very quickly, I'm going to leave them on the board. Which of these nine, I'll take just one or two people to respond. Which of these nine speaks most to you? Which one of those kind of gave you an immediate visceral reaction? Yeah, I need to be. This is my area of fear. I was in a car accident. I was rolling over, passed out. When I came to, I was calling out to God. I was not yelling, I was calling out to God. And I asked him, how long does it take to roll over? And I, I went, okay. I said, well, you're in charge. I don't know where I'm going. I took my hands off the wheels, off the, off the steering wheel. Had I not done that, I would not be alive today. He took over the car, and I landed on the tires. 
and I'm not taking my hands off the wheel this one. That steering wheel. By the way, landing in a car accident, staying on the rubber is always a good thing. <laughs> it's really bad when you land on the paint. So that's kind of a natural thing and a hidden danger because you didn't see that accident coming. That's no. why they call them accidents. Otherwise, it would be called in on purpose. Anybody else? Which of these nine kind of speaks to you where this is, boy, this is where I, I really hold on to God's protection. <clears throat> Number four, in the faithfulness of God. Do you find that kind of faithfulness anyplace else? It would be nice. Do you find that kind of faithfulness in your friends? In your spouse? In your pastor? <laughs> yes, absolutely but the faithfulness of, of God. Then in verses 14 to 16, God gives his pledge in six I will statements. Again, if you have your Psalm 91, I want you to underline those as we come to them. You'll see six I wills. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. The next one, I will protect him because what? He knows, he knows my name. I will answer him. I like that one. And that goes to your story. You're calling out to God and God says, I will answer. I will answer her. In the middle of a car accident, I will answer I will be with him. What's the rest of that quote? In trouble. You like that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a verse to, you know, etch on wood and hang up in your house somewhere. I will be with him in trouble. Next one. I will rescue him. Okay. Think about that one for a minute. Who needs rescue? But we all do. But, but what does it imply? Well, if you're, yeah, you're in trouble. <laughs> People who are sitting on a lounge chair on a deck of a cruise ship generally don't need rescue. Unless you're on the Titanic. Unless you're happen to be on the Titanic. <laughs> then all of a sudden things can change dramatically. But their implication there is somebody is in trouble. Sorry, health and wealth preachers. God said, I will rescue him. Implying that there's something to be rescued, that you're in the middle that you need to be rescued from. And then the last one, I will satisfy him and show him. And how, do, how, how are we satisfied? What's the very last line of, of Psalm 91? Salvation. That's how we're satisfied. People running around, and you can check it out on Facebook, and people are the most unsatisfied things on the planet. And even the very rich are never satisfied. We've seen that when we were studying Ecclesiastes. Remember that? Wealth doesn't satisfy. God said, I will satisfy you, and here's how I'm going to satisfy you. I'm going to show you my salvation. So I'm going to ask the same question. Of those six I will statements, I will deliver, protect, answer, be with, rescue, satisfy. A couple of other people, which of those speak to you the most and why? Number three. Number three, I will answer. Why? I will answer you. We pray, and somehow something happens that we can't Yeah, yeah, right my time. Now, or I wouldn't be asking, you know. But, Obviously, it's beyond my power. I mean, it's divine intervention. But what, what does he assure us? He's going to do it. I'm going to answer. Yeah, he's going to answer. It might not be the right answer. It's always the right answer. Yes. But it might not be the right answer as I perceive it. Yeah, or the timing that you perceive. Yes. But God says, I will answer. 
Yeah. Somebody else. Which of these six I wills? Um, I think the I will be with him and then the I will satisfy him. Um, and compared to me a lot because I take it from the protection, the protection from the debut. Um, uh, it's a little personal to me, but like I've been going through a lot of things lately with addiction and treatments and stuff, but every time I pray, God is still with me. Yeah. And Isn't that great? Yes. That, that's just so great. The other thing we always need to remember too, whenever we find ourselves in one of those, particularly those areas that we need to be rescued, when we got there, God was already there. <laughs> he was already there waiting for us to show up. All right, yeah, I'm in the middle of this. Come on. Now watch me take you out. A good example of that is Moses and Aaron. You know, Moses is complaining to, to God about not being able to speak. And God already got Aaron out of the way. Yes. You know, yeah. Like God already knew he was going to play already on top of it. So. Yep. This is already we've already started. All right. So in in like 20 minutes, let's let's bring in the Jesus part of this because this is Jesus in the Psalms. This Psalm is great. We could bang on this Psalm probably for a couple of weeks if we really wanted to dig into it. But again, that's what I told you at the beginning of the study. I'm just going to, we're going to gloss over these psalms in the hope that it whets your appetite so much that you guys go back in and just really dig into these psalms yourself. So, Jesus had an interaction with this psalm. Um, I need two readers, Matthew 4, 6 and Luke 4, 10 to 11. It's the same thing in two different Gospels. So, Matthew 4, 6, volunteer, volunteer, back there, Cindy. And Luke 4, 10, and 11. Another volunteer. Back there. Okay, go ahead. Matthew 4, 6. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And on their hand they will bear the left, and you will not strike your foot against the stone. So that's Matthew. Ma yeah, that's Matthew's version of it. Go ahead and give Dr. Luke's version of it. Uh, Luke 4, 10, and 11. When he with him, he fell down from here. When he with him, he will command his angels to turn the to harm and curse him. They will lift you up in the hand, so you will not strike the foot against him. Yep. So there's Matthew and Luke both give that same story. So what's happening here? Well, Jesus is tempting Jesus, or Jesus, Satan, excuse me, is tempting Jesus. This is the story of Jesus going into the wilderness, 40 days of fasting, and now Satan comes to him. He's already done the turn the bread into stone, stone into bread. I'm going to just mess everything up this morning. And now we've come to the, the next one. Jesus has already bested Satan by quoting scripture. Satan now says, okay, we want to use scripture? I got you. Takes him to the, the what's called the pinnacle of the te temple. Most Bible scholars believe it was probably one corner of the big portico that looked over the Kidron Valley. Because Jerusalem was built on the hill, so was the temple, and one particular quarter of what was bent had a very sheer drop off. And so they believed that this was probably the area, whether he physically was transported there or in a vision, that's a big argument, doesn't ma matter to me one way or the other. And Satan uses scripture. Jesus, all right, you use scripture. Okay, I got beat on that, that stone to bread thing. I'm gonna use scripture. How about this? <clears throat> Satan's attack here is for Jesus to demonstrate that he's the Messiah by performing this sensational stunt. But notice that Satan doesn't use the entire quote. He omits the phrase, in all your ways. He stops very short. He goes back to Psalm 91, Verse 12, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hand, 
and he admits that to guard you in all your ways. He will command his angels, he skips that part in all your ways, on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. So right there in the middle of the quote, Satan kind of takes a phrase out and tosses it. Yes. He was his same his same methodology. He he wants Jesus to show that he's the Messiah by the sensational stunt, relying on the prophecy of Psalm ninety one that he wouldn't suffer an in injury. And much like the very first temptation, Satan is offering Jesus a shortcut instead of living out God's way. In all your ways. Well, whose ways did Jesus live out? God's ways. So his ways were God's ways. As a believer, because this believers read this and appropriate this for themselves. What are your ways supposed to be? God's ways. It, as long when you're doing God's ways, when you're doing what God wants you to do in your life, God says, "I'm not going to let even you. I'm, you're not even going to stub your toe." Cindy stubbed her toe the night before last. I got woken up at 2 in the morning with a blood curling scream machine. <laughs> you know, when you stub that little toe, you know, <laughs> you find out how pain, you know, it could be at zero dark 30 of the night. And God says, I'm not even going to let that happen. A lot of Bible scholars correlate the three sin groups found in 1 John 2:16. You'll, you'll recognize those right off. For everything that belongs in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And sin always falls into one of those three broad categories. And they see in the temptations of Jesus, the three temptations of Jesus, each one of those areas being attacked. So we're obtaining bread outside the normal way of work is linked to the lust of the flesh. This temptation is linked to the pride of life. I will do something death-defying, which is exactly what you were bringing up. I'm going to do something and test God's ability to fulfill what he says in Psalm 91. So, what we have here, like I said, is the pride of life. One of those three big sin categories that I just read to you out of 1 John 2.16. What Satan was doing, again, much like with the stone to bread, was proposing for Jesus to achieve glory without suffering. He said, man, you do this at the temple, which always had people around it, you step off of here and you just float down, you know, like a Marvel superhero in the movies. Of course, then they would land with one hand on the ground. I don't know why that, that is. But. Now you can have all the glory and no suffering. And how does Jesus respond? Jesus responds with Scripture. So, Satan says, you want the glory? Here's how you can do it. And Scripture says that God's going to do this for you. So you just rely on this. You just do something foolish and step out into the middle of something you have no business doing. Which isn't, by the way, God's ways. Because remember, he admitted the word in all your ways. So instead of doing it God's way, you do it your way. You'll get the glory and you don't have to suffer. Do Christians fall for that? Oh, yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> because we don't want to suffer. We don't want to do that suffering thing to die. Don't, the dying thing, okay, Jack, I know where I'm going, but I don't want to do the suffering thing. But Jesus' response, Matthew 4, 7, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. Now, Jesus was quoting scripture again here. Somebody, very quickly, look up Deuteronomy 6.16. That's right, I should have handed these out before class. Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. 
Way back to the left. Somebody got it? Mark, you got it? No, I don't. Oh, okay. He's he shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Masa. Or Masa. Yeah. Do not put the Lord God. Jesus was now quoting back to the book of Deuteronomy. Do not test your God. Do not step into the middle of something stupid because he's got all those protections that he's just listed for you. But Jesus says, don't do that. Because now they're having an argument about Psalm 91, is what Jesus and Satan were doing. They were arguing Psalm 91 that we just studied. And Jesus said, don't. You have that protection, but you are not to test God to see if God's <coughs> able to do that. God may very well put you into place and rescue you. <laughs> Less than time. Yes. But you're not to put yourself into the mix and say, okay, now God, come rescue me. And as you pointed out, this is the experience of, at Massa where the grumbling against Israelites put the Lord to the test. And what they did there, they, they were grumbling, which they did a lot, with Moses about water where there was none. And he said, don't you put the Lord your God to the test. When you need water, you are going to have it. Do people still do that today? God had promised to protect and preserve the Messiah, but that guarantee presupposed living in God's will. And to claim the promise in an act outside of God's will is in fact a form of testing God. When we try to say, okay, God, fulfill those verses in Psalm 91, but we're living outside of God's will, what are we doing? We are testing God. We are trying to show God, okay, I'm not living where I'm supposed to be. Now you go ahead and fulfill your promise. So let's combine those two. And I'm, I'm way over time. Psalm 91 is all about God's protection of his own that are actively involved with him. In the temptation sequence, we see Satan trying to tempt Jesus with three different shortcuts that Satan intimates would, make, would take Jesus to where he was going, but on a shortcut. See, Satan's temptation and our own pride always start with glory. When Satan tempts you, when your own pride, because Satan doesn't need to tempt us a whole lot, folks. <laughs> this thing about, oh, the devil made me do it. Probably not. <laughs> it was probably just your own innate pride. But it always starts with glory. How can I be number one? How can I be rich? How can I be the handsomest guy on the planet? How can I be the top dog at this agency, how can, whatever. It starts with glory, but Satan and our own pride, when it starts with glory, what does it always end up in? It ends up in suffering. God's plan starts with suffering and ends in glory. In fact, Jesus said to pick up your cross which is a form, a horrible form of death, and follow me. G the way of the cross starts with suffering and ends in glory and is a servant greater than his master. No. But we always want to, and people want to reverse these two, and Satan's glad to try and get us to do that. We saw it in the garden with, did God really say, let's take you right to the glory, let's take you right to the good stuff, and it ended up in suffering, and it's always that same pattern. The focus of all three temptations for Jesus was on self. And Jesus, in his confrontation with him, shows us that it can happen anywhere, including church. Because the second one happened at the temple. 
Temptations to glorify yourself can happen right here in Levine Baptist. Oh, I'm now sound like President Biden. Sorry. I won't whisper. It can happen right here at Levine Baptist Church. You think, oh, I'm at church. Now I'm, I'm, I'm safe. No, no. We have people getting pride problems here all the time. Psalm 91 promises protection from every direction that you can imagine to those who trust him as evidenced by living in the shadow of the Almighty or under his wings. That was a great word picture for those chicks. I used to raise Rock Island chickens and I would see that. Come on, babies, here we go. I never understood how those two little wings, because when I would slaughter one and eat one, that's just not that big, but man, it protected them all. In the temptation attempts, Satan wants Jesus to step out of the shadow and live by his own standards. And our pride and Satan's temptation for us it does the same thing. Step out of the shadow. You're, you're very comfortable there. Okay, you got this. Get your pride going. Now step out of the shadow of all of that list of protection and go do it on your own. Let's start with glory and guess where it's going to end up? Suffering. So take home concepts. We all too often look for great things for ourselves. And then we run and hide when difficulties come our way. Sound familiar to anybody? I'm looking for really cool things for me. And then difficulties come and, ah, I'm out of here. In fact, we regularly ask God that they be removed. Oh, God, take this away from me. It hurts. I don't want to play with this anymore. Aren't I your child? Make it stop hurting. Even Paul did that. He said he prayed multiple times for God to remove the thorn in his flesh. Big arguments as to what that was. But we also know that the term thorn was the same term as a wooden spear. So it was painful, whatever it was. Emotionally, physically. We regularly ask God, remove them. And all too often these difficulties come, though, when we ignore God's will and exalt ourselves. We step out of the shadow, and then we want God to honor his protections from Psalm 91. Okay, I stepped out of the shadow. I got my pride out in front of me. I tried to aggrandize myself. I tried to put myself first. And now I'm in real problems, and I'm hurting, and I'm suffering. God, uh, remember those protections, bring those back into play. Even though he's very long-suffering and, and gracious towards us, we tempt God by trying to force him into doing those Psalm 91 protections when we've stepped out of the shadow. particularly if we've been living contrary to his word. I think it's a very dangerous place to try God's patience. Even though he is long-suffering and gracious beyond belief towards us. God's promise of protection is completely assured to those who live in his shadow, under his protection. But that's a choice. Do you have to live under God's shadow? As a Christian, do you have to live there? No. He still gives you that choice. God's promise of protection is completely assured. We have to remember two things, really. Scripture tells us in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have what? 
Oh my goodness, I can't wait for Joel Osteen to preach on John 16, 33. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see that ever happening, or any of the other health and wealth preachers. In this world, you will have, that's not the word may or can, you will have suffering. Be courageous, I have conquered the world. That all of a sudden now living under the shadow, living under his wings, all those nine areas of protection become very real. The protection of Psalm 91 will only happen in the fullest sense when we actually live with him. The millennial reign and eternity, that's going to be complete. But even for a believer now, we can claim Psalm 91 when we're living under his shadow, living under his wings. In the meantime, we have to do two things. I wish Pastor Jerry was here, because I would have him quote this one. Philippians 4.4, 4, we are to do what? Come on, rejoice. <laughs> Occasionally. Always. Always. And again, I say rejoice. And remember the promise of Romans 8.28, because we know all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. That's in all your ways. That phrase that Satan wanted to take out of the middle of that quote. Harry, what is the fill-in for when a child will die of his in the I'm sorry, somebody have that I'm... I'm oh, oh no, I took that off the screen. I'll get that to you in a second. I'll get that to you in a second. So, those were kind of the take-homes that I took out of it. I hope that you found other take-home and takeaways out of Psalm 91. Matthew and Luke, where Satan was quoting Psalm 91. And be, let's become a group of believers at Levine Baptist Church that live under the shadow, that are completely fearless because we've read Psalm 91 and we know that every area of protection that we can imagine, God's already guaranteed. Pretty cool psalm, isn't it? 16 verses. When's the last time you read Psalm 91? It's good stuff. Steve, would you close? Sure. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the lesson that Harry brought, Father, and the reminder, Father, that you're always there, that you change not, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, in your love and protection and your guidance and your faith for your children, Father, you're always there. Thank you, Father, for that promise. Thank you for the assurance, Lord, and the lesson that we, we heard today, Lord, that uh, we can face tomorrow and then in seven days to come. Father, I just pray, Lord, as we uh, close out this time in this classroom, Father, that you prepare our hearts for the uh, worship service. Father, that we would uh, board up the windows of distraction, that we'd be able to sit content, uh, content and listen contently, Father, with the, uh, the message in song and also in, uh, in the message from the pastor. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for being my Savior and allowing me the opportunity to serve you in this world. Lord, give you the praise of Christ in my prayer. Amen. Amen.